Through the 1980s and 90s, a shocking social panic ignited in the United States before spreading through the rest of the world. Here, law enforcement, psychiatrists, social workers, and occult experts uncovered a vast satanic conspiracy which predated upon hundreds, if not thousands, of children at daycares, infiltrated heavy metal music, it lured in teenagers through the role-playing game Dungeons & Dragons, and all of this was thought to be organized by a grand network of satanic covens presided over by shadowy forces. This satanic network organized the worst imaginable crimes, all in the interest of furthering their own power through allegiance to the great rebel angel. The panic filled lurid paperbacks with tales of satanic ritual abuse. It populated daytime talk shows with imagery of inverted pentagrams painted in dank basements and was the topic of top psychological conferences in support of the rise of religiously motivated occult experts to advise law enforcement. All of which resulted in constant bullying for social nonconformists, hundreds of arrests, prosecution, guilty verdicts, and long prison time, even death sentences, along with accusations which ruined people's lives and livelihoods for hundreds and thousands. The results of the satanic panic are even more shocking when considering that no evidence, and even evidence to the contrary of such claims, has come to light in the now 40 years that have passed. Feeding on centuries of demonological lore set into the social and economic degradation of the last quarter of the 20th century, the satanic panic had a decisive cultural impact, elements of which appear to be re-emerging in the new religious movement of the QAnon and the popularity of the character of Eddie Munson in the recent season of Stranger Things, because in the 80s and 90s you either knew an Eddie Munson or you were an Eddie Munson. The satanic panic also very nearly destroyed my life. If you're interested in magic, hermetic philosophy, alchemy, Kabbalah, or the history of the occult, Make sure to subscribe here to Esoterica and check out my numerous other contents on topics in esotericism, including curated playlists on various topics. Also, if you want to support this work of providing accessible, scholarly, and free content on topics in esotericism here on YouTube for free, I hope you maybe consider taking a look at my Patreon, maybe consider a one-time donation to the project, or you could even use the super thanks option down below the video. Now, Let's explore the Satanic Panic, its ancient origins, and its survival. I'm Dr. Justin Sledge, and welcome to Esoterica, where we explore the arcane in history, philosophy, and religion. Hegemony or dominant social power comes with a range of prices, one of which is anxiety. Even with Christian hegemony established in medieval Europe, institutional religious power experienced a constant anxiety of heresy, apostasy, and heterodoxy. While Christianity was meant to supersede Judaism and be the final revelation until the second coming of Christ, the continued existence of the Jewish people seemed like an indictment of that very supersession, and the rise and success of Islam an indictment of the inevitability of that Christian endgame. Not only was Jewish survival itself theologically vexing, but the Jew increasingly became more and more than just an other of Christianity, but a very near enemy of Christendom itself. Here, the genealogy of conspiracy mutated as a weapon against the Jews from anti-Judaism to anti-Semitism. Hellenistic diatribes against Jewish superstition took the form of claims that 
Jews engaged in annual human sacrifice. The pagan Romans had spread rumors that the early Christians engaged in incestuous orgies and ritual cannibalism in their nocturnal superstitious rituals among the tombs of the dead. These rumors were then co-opted, ironically enough, by early Christians to slander their religious competitors, those that we now call the Gnostics. By the 12th century, these accusations further mutated and began to appear in England that Christian children were being ritually murdered by the Jews. In the early version of this narrative, an international group of Jews decided which Christian would be killed as a part of rituals to return the Jews to their ancestral homelands. Other versions of this have that the killing was done as a ritual mockery of the torture and execution of Jesus. The mature version of this narrative involves the murder of a Christian child, typically in order to use their blood in the preparation of the ritual matzah bread for Passover, Pesach. While the institutional church, to its credit, did attempt to prevent extrajudicial mob violence, this conspiracy theory and the subsequent pogroms would begin in England and spread quickly to the rest of the continent. Evidence for such international ritual killings by Jews, when rarely produced, was, you guessed it, inevitably extracted through unimaginable torture. Now known as the blood libel, this would be the first truly international conspiracy theory which, when combined with the elaborated theory of witchcraft, would form the mythological core of the satanic panic to come centuries later. Though the blood libel against Jewish communities would continue through the centuries till now, somehow unabated, a new mutation in the QAnon new religious movement that claims that political and social elites, sometimes globalists, which is just a riff on the old international Jew canard, this idea that they are extracting adrenochrome from children in forms of ritual satanic abuse, this is simply a contemporary variant of this very ancient anti-Semitic conspiracy theory. The theological anxieties mentioned earlier were met with political and social instability, and into those dreadful margins came war and inquisition even against fellow Christians. Here came the persecution of heterodox Christians such as the Waldensians, whose insistence on radical apostolic poverty threatened the entirety of the church aristocracy, it was horrifically extended into the wars to root out what the medievals called the Albigensians or the Manichaeans, who we now call the Cathars of southern France, the area around Languedoc, upon whom the same old slanders of incestuous orgies and cannibalism would be heaped. The massacre at Béziers in 1209 claimed the lives of thousands, with the so-called heretics being indistinguishable from the rest of the population. One crusader is said to have remarked, caidete eos noet inum dominus qui sunt eos, kill them all, the Lord will know his own. Tens of thousands of innocent people were murdered and subjected to trial and torture during the war and the 20 year long inquisition that followed. You may be surprised to learn that an emerging scholarly position now holds that no such Cathars, at least as an institutional rival to the medieval church, ever even existed. A tiny few of those tortured and massacred were perhaps heterodox Christians, maybe dualists of a certain kind, though yet they were Christian, while the rest were simply regular medieval people caught in a religious territorial dispute that cost them their lives. The Cathars were, as the emergent position argues, invented in the minds of inquisitioners and then further discovered in the tortured confessions of those accused as such. Finally, in the theological, economic, and social anxieties of the period following the Black Death emerged a new kind of heretic, the witch. In this theory, what is now called the elaborated theory of witchcraft, as developed in the minds of inquisitors and jurists, theologians, and philosophers of the late medieval world, and to some degree the early modern period, held that a new 
woman-led heretical sorcery sect had appeared in Europe, marked by entering into a pact or a covenant with the devil, and thus, fundamentally, this was apostasy from Christianity. To secure this covenant, there were sexual relations with the devil and various demons, aerial flight for the purposes of attending a Sabbath or a synagogue of Satan, which again, we'll get a little anti-Semitism in there, which is presided over by Satan himself, at which point the initiates enter into said pact, typically by signing their name in blood, followed by incestuous and promiscuous sex. Remember that back from earlier. The general practice of maleficent magic, the slaughter of fetuses and babies, remember that whole eaten babies part, cannibalism, and various means for preventing human beings from procreating, whose aim? The entire aim of this heretical sect, so-called, was to undermine Christendom as part of the devil's ongoing war with God. In fact, by the mid-15th century, this theory had become positively apocalyptic and was arguing that the new witch heresy was actually the final attempt on the part of the devil to forestall his impending doom by sending human beings down a spiral of sin and crime as a kind of final outrage against God, but also as a way of delaying the apocalypse. Regardless, the elaborated theory of witchcraft, as it is called now, while it varied from region to region or writer to writer, had pretty much coalesced by about 1500 and thus set the stage for the frenzied persecutions which would follow, resulting in the deaths of around 40 to 60,000 people, mostly women, up to around 1750. That's not counting the people simply accused, imprisoned, tortured, stripped of their lands, reputations, and their human dignity remains unknown. No one knows how many people that was. But again, what's clear from the evidence of hundreds of years of scholarship is that virtually all of those people subject to the witch trials, they were just Christians, and not an international conspiracy of satanic witches or pagan survivals from antiquity. They were just Christians innocent Christians. Again, with the witch, like the Gnostic or the Cathar, they were a fantasy of demonologists reinforced by confessions had at torture. The ascendancy of the mercantile banking classes and the rise of the Enlightenment with its focus on reason, evidence-based critical thinking, the rejection of dogma, individual rights, and the shift toward materialist naturalism, the separation of religion and politics, a la Spinoza, did much to stop the objective spread of these mythological tropes and the judicial and extrajudicial violence that had accompanied them for centuries. Jews would eventually gain civil rights, religious difference was eventually tolerated, and the presumption of innocence of the accused meant that the procedures and evidence would determine guilt with torture, finally, finally disappearing from jurisprudence officially and unofficially. Of course, none of this happened perfectly, even up to this day, but in light of what I've just discussed, it's at least substantial progress, and any kind of postmodern cynicism about progress and meta-narratives, they can be damned in my opinion, that's real progress. But there's no denying that the mythological substratum, the religious or social other as enemy, the international conspiracy against Christendom or the West, and the specifically satanic elements of sorcery and child sacrifice, that mythological substratum remained more or less totally intact as a kind of meme unit. And as post-World War II America began to spiral into social, political, and economic crisis, it would reemerge as a satanic panic. Of course, the first great other in the post-war period was communism, and the House of Committee on Un-American Activities and Senator Joseph McCarthy laid the public groundwork for wide-scale conspiratorial thinking. And along with the Second Red Scare came additional conspiratorial comorbidities, as I call them, such as the idea that fluorinated water was used for mind control, or that the polio vaccine was a red plot to weaken the population for a future communist invasion. Yeah, the anti-vaxxers, they were also anti-polio vaccine because it made the reds, yeah. Social and economic conditions would continue to weaken through the 1960s, which saw the first explosions of the hippie subculture, 
widespread experimentation with drugs and other mind-altering substances, the rise in popularity of the new religious movement, along with the disaster of the Vietnam War, greatly weakening the idea of American world supremacy, the gay liberation movement, the rise of the civil rights movement, and the increasing stagnation of the U.S. economy. This period would also include the founding of the non-theist but highly publicized Church of Satan, the Tate-LaBianca murders framed as a cult killing by the prosecution meant to induce a race war, though that narrative has been subject to intense and reasonable doubt, along with the general occult revival prominently featuring the religious thought of folks like Aleister Crowley, along with the fertility nature-based new religious movement of Wicca, neither of which neither of which are in the least bit satanic, nor linked with any criminal activity. The 1973 through 1975 recession and the world oil crisis would signal the real stagnation to come. In fact, real wage growth in the U.S. has been basically flat, given inflation for this entire period up until now. Along with the 1980 through 82 recession, this would see the worst U.S. unemployment since the Great Depression. That figure, by the way, the one from the 1980 to 1982 uh, recession, that's only been matched this year in 2022. We are in a recession about like that, no matter what anyone says. Further, and in light of this real and perceived degradation of the social, religious, and economic stability of the U.S. would see the rise of the moral majority. This was a major foray of evangelical Christians into politics as a block, really, greatly fostering a conservative reaction from the local social layer to the American presidency by the early 1980s. It is into this complex social, economic, political, and religious matrix of real perceived U.S. degeneration in the final decades of the 20th century would come ancient legends of cultic sorcery, witchcraft, ritual abuse, human sacrifice, and an international network of Satanists as a means to make sense of just that degeneration. The Satanic Panic would truly emerge in 1980 with the publication of Michelle Remembers by the Canadian psychiatrist Lawrence Posder. Just as a content warning, the following couple sections detail the disturbing claims of so-called Satanic ritual abuse. In this decisively important volume, Pastor's patient and eventual wife, wife, can you marry? Ethics, would come to recount how she was subject to what is now known as satanic ritual abuse from 1954 to 1955 in Victoria, British Columbia. Michelle would uh, allegedly uncover lurid details of torture, sexual assault, child and human sacrifice, horrifying body modification, including having horns and a tail sewn onto her body before being ripped off, being put into a cage with snakes, being covered with various kinds of insects, etc., etc. This satanic cult, led by her, her own father allegedly, was even once presided over by Satan himself before Michelle was saved by the miraculous intervention of the Virgin Mary and, and Jesus. The memories of this horrifying abuse were repressed until being later unlocked through the rather unconventional, unethical therapy of Dr. Pazder, including her therapeutic conversion to Catholicism his religion, by the way, during one of her therapy sessions. Despite the numerous and horrible details, no evidence has ever corroborated any of the claims made in this book. Her father denies that such abuse ever took place. Her sisters, who are never actually mentioned in the book, to now deny any such tales. There's no record of her missing school to endure some of the rituals, which in her telling of it went on for weeks at a time. And of course, there are no spikes in missing babies or children during that period. And the gathering that she, that she describes of hundreds of Satanists in the forest would be pretty hard to disguise. Further, the sessions themselves seem infused with leading questions, including details that Pazdell may have actually picked up during his time in West Africa and some of the rituals that he witnessed there, along with the standard set of legends that survived from the Middle Ages. In fact, there seems to be good evidence that demonological lore is being interpolated back into some of these narratives. 
Michelle's account would be featured in People magazine prior to publication, a very popular magazine. It's like the kind of thing at the grocery store aisle where it attracted intense public attention. Something about this narrative grabbed the general population's imagination. Thus, even prior to publication, Pastor gained a $100,000 advance in the 19, late 70s, late, early 80s, on the hardback version and another $242,000 for the eventual paperback publication with both Pazder and Michelle, who, despite now both being Catholic, divorced their previous spouses to marry one another, they became overnight occult experts and began appearing on a host of television shows to promote their book and, by extension, promote the idea of satanic ritual abuse. Without doubt, Michelle Remembers became the standard narrative that served as the foundation for what would become a cottage industry of memory recovery practices in the emergent psychiatric communication network, something that had a kind of beta testing in some of the recovered memory stuff from the UFO phenomenon. Among this network of trained professionals would spread the idea of repressed memories containing narratives of widespread satanic ritual abuse. These narratives then would go on to be publicized, often on national television, only for new cases to emerge as a now feedback loop began to develop and deepen. Confirmation bias, leading questions, questionable forms of therapy, and the administration of psychotropic drugs, a total misunderstanding of the nature of memory, social pressure not to question survivors of this, and groupthink within the very psychiatric communication network, even in academic settings, surprise, surprise, groupthink in academia, not only perpetuated both the notion of widespread ritual satanic abuse, but also legitimated the accounts as confirmed by PhDs and licensed doctors without even a thought of recourse to, you know, corroborating some of these claims with this thing called evidence and ignoring almost always incontrovertible evidence to the contrary. The Michelle Remembers virus was now loose within the psychiatric and psychological worlds, and if it could spread and infect among university-trained doctors, you can only imagine what it was about to do at every other layer of society. Among the earliest community-level panics occurred unsurprisingly near the location of the alleged events of Michelle Remembers. That's the area around Victoria, British Columbia in 1982, just two years after the publication of the book, where reports emerged from an anonymous child abuse tip line that a baby would be kidnapped and sacrificed by a satanic cult on June 14th. The threat, which otherwise sounds, well, it sounds completely crazy, was taken seriously, probably because of the impact of Michelle Remembers, and armed guards were placed in maternity wards of local hospitals. Rumors of animal sacrifice began to fly, with animal remains found in a nearby forest taken as evidence, because, you know, animals never die in the forest, and things began to get worse from there. Provincial level government alerted social workers to report any babies that may be in danger. Again, a very vague warning, as if social workers aren't already looking for babies that are maybe in danger. This community panic fueled by local and national reporting began to spread all through the United States and Canada. By 1983, a mother suffering from severe mental illness accused the son of the owner of her child's daycare of sexual abuse. What followed was the Martin preschool trial, one of the most expensive public trials in U.S. history. By 1983, seven people were charged with nearly 350 counts of child abuse based on accusations of children informed by leading questions resulting not only in abuse allegations, but also depictions of witches flying through the air, rides in hot air balloons, secret tunnels beneath the daycare where the abuse is said to have taken place, the participation of the abuse by naked people from Hollywood, orgies at car washes and even airports, secret pipes where the children would be flushed down to be abused before being cleaned up by their parents. Sounds like Super Mario Brothers. Even action star Chuck Norris. Chuck Norris was accused of participating in this abuse. 
The trials lasted for seven years. They cost $15 million. They, re they rendered no real evidence and resulted in no convictions. It maimed the lives and reputations of those involved. It traumatized those children and their parents, so much so that there are still people out there looking for secret tunnels after the dust has settled all these years. This wing of the satanic panic would ignite a wave of satanic ritual accusations against over a hundred different daycare providers, some of which are still serving prison sentences on basically nothing evidence and inflammatory nonsense. The effect of all this would only further entrench the very social problems that gave rise to the panic in the first place. In fear of the prosecution, many childcare workers simply shuttered their facilities, thus transferring that burden of childcare onto women, especially working class women, who were already experiencing the worst of the brunt of the recession that was fueling many of the elements that gave rise to the panic. This again further entrenched the feedback loop in the social level that was giving rise to the panic in the first place. By 1984, we see the first appearance of an idea of a teenage devil-worshipping cult appear linked with nocturnal rituals, which were probably just late-night legend trips whereby youths go to local locations, often graveyards or bridges, in the folklore's telling and reenacting cycle. By 1985, this trope that the satanic cultists would target blonde, blue-eyed children on Halloween now introduced a specifically racial component into the panic combined with the emergent stranger danger narrative that was taking hold in the 1980s. That same year, local law enforcement publicly speculated that there are at least 1,500 secret Satanists active in Ohio alone, and that many of them are homosexuals, now introducing homophobia into the panic with the gay community already in the midst of the AIDS epidemic, an epidemic already left to rage unchecked because of institutional homophobia. On May 16, 1985, the popular nationally syndicated show 2020 ran a segment entitled The Devil Worshippers, greatly accelerating the national spread of the panic. By now, local media had reached the national level and the feedback loop deepened. Daytime TV shows would act as a kind of social multiplier effect, with the most important being appearances on The Oprah Winfrey Show and The Sally Jesse Raphael Show, which would feature largely women recounting alleged abuse at the hands of these satanic cultists, and those featuring accounts of alleged satanic cults throughout the entire country on The Geraldo Rivera Show, with the November 19, 1987 show proving absolutely decisive in the history of the satanic panic, followed up on the next year with three, three back-to-back -back episodes in the October of 1988, driving home the topics of teenage Satanism or satanic breeders, babies for the sacrifice, and devil worship. While Geraldo would eventually apologize in 1995 for the devastating impacts these rating-seeking episodes would have, they would likely prove to be the catalyst for some of the most intense periods of the panic, costing many their dignity and even their freedom. By the late 1980s, the satanic panic had spread deeply into the United States, and the first cases of daycare workers and teenagers would begin to appear in the United Kingdom, the Netherlands, and Australia, and beyond. The satanic panic by the mid to late 80s had spread well beyond the borders of the United States and Canada. Who were the victims in the satanic panic? Of course, the first and foremost were vulnerable children. These kids were the first victims of priming, a form of leading questions and indirect suggestion by which the answers, the answers to all of this was satanic ritual abuse, would be fed to those children and the questioning arranged to reinforce that the answers were satanic ritual abuse. Of course, children are highly impressionable and highly imaginative, and once suspected by social workers or religious zealots or law enforcement, it was only a matter of time before it was discovered through the process of priming and the leading questions, a technique actually developed all the way back by the inquisitors of the Middle Ages. It was so effective, it often didn't even need torture. 
Though there can be no denying that leading children to induce such horrors as their own abuse and then implanting that abuse as a form of memory, then convincing their parents of such abuse in the process of pro prosecuting the alleged abusers, actually only deepened and widened the circle of trauma. Further were the daycare providers themselves. Many of these people were lifetime professionals with a deep love of children. Being accused of horrible abuse ruined their lives emotionally, financially, legally, and socially. Further, victims were people suffering from mental illness whose very mental health professionals manipulated them through a range of therapies which included deepening their trauma by planting false memories of satanic ritual abuse, as noted earlier. Many of these people never recovered, with the professional and ethical failures of the psychological and psychiatric community never fully accounted for, at least in the literature. The next victims were those who stood at the edges of the local social systems and were made to be the scapegoats as a satanic panic fell upon their community. The real and perceived social degeneration of religious, social, moral, and economic life, especially in the hardest hit working classes communities of the early 1980s, required some social explanation. The rise of the Reagan and Thatcher administrations were socio-political attempts to return to the glory Hollywood years of a couple of generations prior, but social conditions actually continued to slip. In those hardest hit communities, this pent up frustration, anxiety, and rage needed, it needed an outlet. Unfortunately, that outlet would be those to blame within their own communities for turmoil, especially in the event of a shocking crime or unexpected tragedy that would push that community over the edge. In fact, a wide range of community disruptions would trigger a panic, and those targeted were usually those at the social margins. Very often, the initial targets would be teenagers that willfully rebelled against an otherwise increasingly conservative social system. That rebellion took the form of alternative clothing and hairstyles, listening to emergent heavy metal music often imbued with mythological and maybe sometimes satanic imagery, the emergently popular form of horror films, rejecting or rebelling against standard religious, i.e. Protestant Christian norms, including adopting alternative religious beliefs or even pseudo-Satanism. Or just rejecting social norms and engaging in much parodied nerdy hobbies in the 1980s, especially the fantasy role-playing game Dungeons and Dragons. Heavy metal music would be accused of intentionally hiding satanic messages through the process of backmasking or subliminal messages, whereby its listeners would be induced to murder, or suicide, or to delve deeper into the occult and satanism. Both Ozzy Osbourne and Judas Priest would be sued on these very grounds, with the defendants winning in both of those cases. Not that actual evidence means anything in the midst of a panic like this. They were public burnings of records and cassettes deemed satanic. The role-playing game Dungeons and Dragons would be brought to prominence by the tragic suicide of, of James Dallas Egbert III, whose death was associated with the game, though without any substantiating evidence whatsoever. This was again reinforced by the made-for-TV movie starring a young Tom Hanks, Mazes and Monsters, which again associated fantasy role-playing games with dangerous psychosis. This effect would be amplified through further suicides associated with Dungeons & Dragons, unfortunately, with the founding of Bad, or Bothered About Dungeons & Dragons, which would be joined by the rising tide of evangelicals who further argued that D&D induced its players to anti-Christian, pagan, occult behavior, as a kind of gateway into the occult and Satanism more generally. Of course, actual social psychological data indicates no connection between games of any kind and violence or criminality, and that cooperative games like Dungeons and Dragons and other RPGs generally actually contraindicate antisocial behavior. Regardless, it would be largely male teens sometimes delinquents or those even suffering from mental illness, often associated with heavy metal music, role-playing games, recreational drug use, nocturnal folklore adventures, and interest in alternative philosophies or spiritualities, 
often from poor or working class or otherwise marginal families that would bear the brunt of most of the accusations where the satanic panic entered their communities. Often accusations would be mere rumors, which of course still harmed reputations, but could also include the threat and reality of mob violence, which happened a good bit in the 1980s, snap judgments and arrests, and even convictions for serious crime, almost always fueled by publicity and outrage, lack of proper legal defense, despite an otherwise wholesale lack of any substantiating evidence linking these young people to actual crimes. Even when the charges were eventually dropped, even if it took decades, the damage had been done, with the media intensely focusing on the lurid, alleged satanic-induced crime, but hardly mentioning when these cases were dropped and the people were acquitted of any wrongdoing. This left their reputations and lives in shambles often. The perpetrators of the satanic panic were like most moral crusaders in history, convinced of the existence of a profound evil preying upon their community and committed to rooting it out by any means necessary. History rarely gives us purely good victims nor purely evil perpetrators, and the satanic panic bears this out. Psychiatrists were seeking to help their patients. Social workers were looking after the safety of children. Local news was trying to report the news as they saw it. Law enforcement was seeking to protect their communities, and religious zealots or occult experts thought themselves engaged with battle against profoundly evil forces in their midst. Parents sought to protect their kids, and prosecutors tried to ensure that no crimes had taken place and to adequately punish those they thought had. Every social system uses shame and bullying to enforce non-legal social norms, sadly. The same could be said of the Inquisitors of the Middle Ages and the Witch Hunters of the Early Modern Period. Evil, as Hannah Arendt has shown us, is the banality often of just doing nothing, following the crowd, following your orders, being informed by outrage and taking pleasure in scapegoating revenge, rather than the critical examination of what actual evidence says. It's unpopular to introduce a strong anti-rumor social policy, including counter-explanations for what's happening other than indulging in bizarre satanic cult narratives. Public calls for critical thinking are always unpopular, and the slow, socially unpopular form of justice through reason and the refusal to allow religious fury to shape the secular processes of civil society, law enforcement, and the due process of the courts. One of the most dangerous perpetrators, aside from the mass media, during the satanic panics were the self-appointed Satanism or occult experts. These people had no academic training in history or religious studies, or much other for that matter. They would enter into communities, often following a tragedy of some kind, only to stoke the flames of practically word-for-word -word medieval legends and myths. The panic would quickly ensure trapping those in its snare, further destroying this very social fabric that facilitated the panic in the first place. With these so-called experts well on their way, some of them handsomely paid for what they had just done well before the dust settled and lives were ruined. To my knowledge, not a single of these modern-day witch hunters were ever sued or prosecuted, yet another failure of justice during the satanic panic. As the 1980s gave way to the 1990s, the major wave of the panic was coming to an end, especially in larger metropolitan areas. However, in suburban areas, especially working class and deeply religious communities, especially in the American South, local panics would continue to emerge through the mid and late 1990s. And that's where the satanic panic very nearly destroyed my life. On October 1st, 1997, I was 16 years old, and a young man, an acquaintance of mine, dropped a pile of papers in front of me, instructing me to give them to a mutual friend. The top page mentioned very clearly the word murder, and was also clearly a last will. Earlier that morning, he had committed matricide, and then re-entered the school later that morning, murdered his ex-girlfriend, another young woman sitting near her, and then began shooting randomly into the crowd, injuring seven other people. 
This was all two years before the horrors of Columbine and the wave of mass shootings that have followed. Less than a week later, six other young men, including myself, were arrested and charged with being part of a murderous, satanic conspiracy. In the weeks and months that followed, one by one, the charges were reduced and then dropped. Eventually, the perpetrator of the crimes was put on trial, and while demonic influence featured prominently during the trials, although wasn't there in the original confession at all, there was no real mention of the satanic conspiracy any longer. In December of 19, nearly a year and a half after being accused myself, the last of the charges were dropped when a grand jury came to the conclusion there wasn't enough evidence to charge a crime. No evidence, in fact. And that exculpatory evidence, long then actually known to the prosecution, contraindicated any wrongdoing on my part. Certainly I made mistakes in the aftermath of this shooting, taking that bundle of writings to the media when the police basically refused to take them the morning of the crime was certainly a mistake, even for a 16-year-old. But certainly rapid arrests without much in the way of evidence, or any in the way of evidence, the dozens of leading interrogations of children without their parents or counsel, the blurring of church and state in some of the criminal proceedings, those were also mistakes. But at 16, I was the weird kid printing off alchemical text in Latin at the library printer. I was the, the kid playing D&D, &D, though, with none of the other accused people. Actually, some of those people I'd never even met before. It's hard to be in a conspiracy with people you never met. I was the kid who discovered his Jewish heritage. It was actually over at the local synagogue learning Hebrew. I was also the kid with the nine Chanel shirt. But I was also the kid whose good friend was actually a head cheerleader at the school. I was a kid that had a ton of friends and never really experienced much in the way of bullying personally, although it was certainly endemic. Life is complicated. People are complicated. And no one narrative captures what happened to me and that community, nor anyone or any community, when a tragedy or the satanic panic happened. But when the satanic panic came to my community, it very nearly destroyed my life and the lives of many other people. And even more grotesque was the process by which the families and the victims were told that, that a satanic cult had done this horrible crime to them, only to watch the narrative evaporate with no explanation from community leaders when the reality that it never happened that way became apparent. A terrible crime happened in my community and the satanic panic only functioned to deepen the trauma and lives more generally. I can only say that for myself, and that's all I can speak for, I've tried to move on and live my life the best that I can since then. In fact, my interest in esoterica more generally was ironically deepened by what I experienced and if you've ever wondered why I have such an allergy to conspiracy theories, and I focus so much attention on historical demonologists and the witch trials, this is probably why. It's, it's part of my psychology at this point. Of course, this channel isn't about me, and it's not about me and my beliefs. It's about studying esoterica and presenting it using all the tools I have available to me, all the while trying to be as objective as possible. I'm sure I'm going to fail at that in this episode. This is just part of who I am. But there's just no way for me to discuss the satanic panic without at least mentioning how it dramatically impacted my life. Though, I'll be honest, I'm not going to be answering questions about this incident in the comments, nor through my website through personal correspondence. It's honestly pretty traumatic opening up about all this on the the internet, on YouTube, and I'm not going to relive it in microdoses in the comments section. If you're curious, I've actually updated my FAQ on my website with some specific details of what happened and didn't happen to clear up a lot of misinformation. You can check out the FAQ on my website, but at least for now, this is really all I want to say about it publicly, though. I might be interested in talking with a real journalist about this at some point, because I don't think the story of this entire incident has ever really been fleshed out. 
The satanic panic had its roots in the European imagination of heresy, witchcraft, and demonology, and then roared into existence into the real and perceived social, religious, moral, and economic degradation of the early 1980s, but continued well into the 1990s and is seeing something of a renaissance, a resurgence in the mythology of the QAnon political religious movement. It also very likely had an impact on many people watching this episode. Perhaps the single best analysis of the Satanic Panic is Jeffrey Victor's title of that name. It's a book that not only informed me in this episode greatly, but I have to admit, it was also kind of deeply cathartic for me to read somehow. It helped me to make sense of what had happened to me and my community, and given that, it healed, I think, some of that trauma. Thank you, Jeffrey Victor. If you were a victim of the panic then, or the echoes of it now, or just Christian hegemony more generally from being bullied or marginalized, even physically accosted or accused of things that you weren't, that you didn't do or weren't as a person, I think you might find this volume similarly illuminating. I only wish that there were a second volume extending this really ingenious analysis from the early 1990s, where the book actually ends, up till now and the QAnon movement. There are a great many lessons to be drawn out of the 40 years since the Satanic Panic, and some of which I've actually articulated or tried to articulate in this episode. Though I think one that lingers with me the most are a couple of quotes, one from Shakespeare's The Tempest, what's past is prologue, and the other from a fellow southerner, Faulkner, the past is never dead, it's, it's not even past. Thus, when I focused on demonologists, the witch trials are here in the satanic panic, just know that I'm never really talking about merely the past. I'm also trying to warn us about a potential future, a future that people watching this channel won't be safe in. And so that's a future I'm willing to do my best to prevent. I'm Dr. Justin Sledge, and thank you for watching Esoterica where we explore the arcane in history, philosophy, and religion.